All right, if you would please take your Bibles and we'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Take a few minutes tonight to continue our series on uh, Proverbs from my father. And uh, I believe we probably have a few pictures of my dad. Once again, if you don't mind showing those, if those are available back there, Dwight. And we can show them. If they were not available, that's fine. But my dad, years ago, uh, of course, uh, he's been with the Lord now for 21 years. He died in 1995. But he raised six children. And uh, each of us had a great dad who loved us very, very much. He was raised in a home where he did not, uh, was not exposed to the gospel through his home. Thank God a Sunday school teacher when he was, when he was 11 years old uh, went out and reached out to he and his little brother Doug and led them to the Lord Jesus Christ. After that went into the army and then got out of the army, came back to Knoxville, Tennessee, his hometown, and there got uh, involved in a local church. The Spirit of God drew him back to a church. There's a picture of my dad in the army and a few other pictures there. You can just go on through and slide through those if you want. But uh, I certainly, um, there we go. Boy, now it's me and him together. Look at that. <laughs> How about that? That's unbelievable photography there. There he is in my days, and I was an elementary child. There I was in junior high, I think, and it's a picture of our family. What a great, a great dad uh, Richard Lynn Wilkerson was. Before he passed away, he wrote in a notebook things, because people would ask him, how did you get your kids to turn out right? How did you raise good kids? And we're not all the way ought to be, for sure. He had six children, four boys and two girls. And we moved around like gypsies, literally every time the rent come due, just about we moved again. It seems like we're always in the move. But my dad would say, well, they've got a really godly mother and a loud mouth dad. That's what he would tell them. And, uh, but he began to think about what are some things that the Lord helped us in raising children. He wrote those in a little notebook that my mother gave to me after he passed away. And so I put those little lessons down and then looked up verses that would kind of back up what he did. Now, some of them are his strong opinions or opinions that he had. But I think all of them have principles that are backed up from the scriptures. And, and so we've taken uh, several weeks going through this. I won't review all the other lessons that we've had. But tonight I want to go over about uh, five other things that he said. We probably have about another five lessons or so that we can go over with other principles that he shared with us. And uh, my dad, of course, uh, was a, he was strict and, uh, on certain things and loosey-goosey on other things. But one thing I knew, he loved me. My dad was very good about expressing uh, love. He would tell me almost every day, I love you, John. I love you, John. And I was so grateful for that. Very grateful. I, I reminded uh, as something I heard Brother McCoy say one time. Every child needs three things. They need affection, they need direction, and they need correction. Every child is, is going to need a lot of time, someone to let them know he loves them. And someone put it in percentages, and I wouldn't argue with the percentage. He said every child needs 70% affection, 20% direction, and 10% correction. And I do believe that whenever we love our children and we convince them we love them and keep their heart, that's huge in, in the life of a child. I love what the Bible says in Psalm 127, and it's a psalm of, of the family. And it's where it says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and Sit up late and eat. Get up. Uh, sit up late and eat the bread of sorrow, because he giveth his beloved sleep. One of the things that rests the heart of a child is to know that they're loved. And to love a child, you need to discipline a child. A child left to himself bringeth embarrassment and shame to himself and to his family. Uh, yet, who, who if, if a man doesn't discipline his child, he hates his child. The Bible uses hard terms there. But whoso loveth his child chasteneth him betimes. And we learn that from God. God does not let us. If, you're, if, you, if you can sin and it doesn't have any conviction and God never deals with you, be careful. You're probably not saved. Anyone who's saved has the disciplined hand of God upon him. And whenever you do something wrong and you say, you know what, there's no reason in the world I should have got caught for that or had this conviction for that, except for God knows everything. It ought to make you feel, well, I'm glad God loves me. I'm glad he, doesn't, he, he disciplines me. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. And learning to, learning to discipline children, learning to love children, and children need, they need restraint. Um, there's nothing wrong with a skateboard. But children by themselves 
cannot handle the skateboard culture. A skateboard means I have to wear my pants down halfway down my, my, my back of my leg and I have to beg baggy, baggy shirts and my hat's on sideways and I have to subscribe to this magazine. Oh, it gets crazy. But a, a child needs, it, needs, it, needs someone to help him with that. Nothing wrong with a video game. I'm sure that they're, 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 they have their place and sometimes they can be a little bit of a thing. But, but, but young people do not have a stop. They do not have a left or a right. They just take things to extremes. That's why God gave them a dad. That's why God gave them a mom to help them monitor those things. There's nothing wrong with sports. But sports can become a god. Video games can become a god. And then all of a sudden you have adult men who, who struggle with, with those things. And that's their escape because they don't have, they didn't have restraints. Someone that stopped them when they're young. And so that's why God gives them parents. And uh, parenting is a huge responsibility. It's overwhelming sometimes. And sometimes I tell, I'll tell young people, listen, uh, you've never been a parent before. <laughs> and you're going to find it's difficult to be a parent. Sometimes I tell my children, it's my first time being a parent for you. It's hard. I don't know exactly how to do it. And I'm learning. And you, thank you for being patient with me. And uh, learning to apologize sometimes for our children is very, very good. As to our children is very good. But here are a few things, five things I'll share with you quickly. I hope we can get through all five of them. But if we're not, we'll, we'll continue later. But let's look at number one. Number one, make sure your boys get a good haircut, not a perm or a style. Hey, how about that? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, my dad used to sing this song he heard somewhere. First Corinthians 11 is still in the book. I know that it is because I just took a look. For a man to have long hair, it says it's a shame. So why bring disgrace to my dear Savior's name? Go get a haircut, John. <laughs> and that's what I would do. I didn't get it permed. I didn't get it colored. I didn't get it styled. I got it cut. And uh, he said, don't be an embarrassment to yourself. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. Now, in the Bible, John the Baptist had long hair. He never had his hair cut. Samuel never had his hair cut. Samson never had his hair cut. And it was an embarrassment to them because their whole life was, why do you got long hair? It's because I'm a Nazarite. It was an embarrassment to them, and they did. They bore the embarrassment for the sake of the name of, of God. Uh, Jesus did not have long hair. He did not. He was not a Nazarite. He was, from Nazar he was from Nazareth, but he was not a Nazarite. He did not have long hair, and I don't care who paints it, Michelangelo or whoever it is, uh, that's, they weren't there when it happened. And I, I can't believe that God would put that in the Bible and him have long hair. That's not the case. How long hair is how long, and that's, that's something that uh, can be done. But let's look real quick at the verse. It's right in the Bible. I don't think we can miss it. Apostle Paul is teaching people about that particular principle in a place called Corinth. Corinth was a, a wicked city. People who lived wickedly, they would say, oh, you've been Corinthianized. You've been made like the, the city of Corinth. It would be like the Las Vegas Strip or maybe uh, the French Quarter of New Orleans. It was a wicked area. And uh, it was a very vile place, and uh, people, people had different cultures. And he, he wrote to write them about the cultures and give them God's opinion on things. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? It's an embarrassment for a man to have long hair. That's the biblical principle. My dad believed that. He would teach us that. And I think it's a good principle in, in today, and, and it becomes more fashionable. Nowadays, you see guys in football games, and they've got, they've got long hair coming out their helmet, and they think they're all that and everything, but that's not God's opinion. He didn't think they're all that. He thinks that men should look like men, and ladies should look like ladies. And distinction is very, very important. Um, there's several reasons why we wear clothes. And we live in a day where, where girls, uh, the girls, have got, you got, I had a guy the other day tell me he went to work and there was a man there wearing a dress. And uh, they laughed at him and the boss got mad at him for laughing at him. He said, what are you doing? You're wearing a dress. And thinks, you know, it's a guy thinking he's, he, he wants to be like a girl. And it's, it, it messes with people, but we live in a society where unisex has been very, very popular. Now, our ladies, more, more than not, they wear pants, and the, and the guys want to wear a dress. And if you go anywhere in the world, or you go anywhere in the world, they can tell which bathroom to go to based upon what the, the person has. 
But there's four reasons that dress is important. Number one, dress is good for protection. It's protection. It's, most of us are very appreciative. We can wear clothes. Clothes are good for protection. Clothes are good for modesty. Modesty is, a, is, a, uh, is, a, is an area that, that every, every man and every lady ought to concern them about. In, in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, modesty on a lady is a sign of submission to the Lord. It's needed for her prayers to be effectual. Is a modest, a modest apparel. The Bible teaches that. The Bible says there is an attire of a harlot. That means somebody who dresses some, that, that in a provocative way. And uh, so dress is good for protection. It's good for modesty. It's good for distinction between the sexes. So you know whenever you, you see someone, you said that's a man, that's a lady. And this also falls in the place of, of hair. Uh, he said it's, it's an embarrassment for a man to have long hair. It's a shame unto him if he has long hair. For a lady, it's a covering. For a lady, it's natural. It's something that, that, is, that is there, and, and you can see, and whenever you see that folks that want to mix the sexes, you can oftentimes see that, that uh, a lady will get real, real short hair. And then the men will grow long hair. But then the other reason, too, for, for that is, is for a testimony. And I think this is some, one of the reasons that you need, you need to understand the dress codes and things of that nature and, and, and why you ought to evaluate what I wear for protection, for modesty, for distinction, and for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was, I was telling, I've told this before, but I, we had a, a little family, we... We, were, we were, had, a, had a group of college students over our house one day and we were playing volleyball out there in the middle of our, uh, in the little park area that we have across the street from our home. And the college kids were there. We were having so much fun. It was just laughing and just, just having a great time. And a man and his wife and kids were walking by and they walked by, we waved at them. And she said to her husband, that's the kind of people I need to associate with. There's something different about them. And a few days later, they came over knocking knocked on our door, and they said, we have children. We're new in the neighborhood. Is your daughter, we, we came by here, and we saw such wholesome people. They said they, they all were so distinctively different. They were laughing. Their dress told me that they were Christians. And would your daughter watch our kid? He, we live down the street and to this thing, and, and now Lydia goes and watches their children with the regular thing. And, and, and they all did that because of what they saw, the testimony of the Lord and the dress of the young people. I think it's very, very important. I think it's something we ought to think about. But my dad would say, make sure your boys get a haircut, not a perm or a hairstyle. Number two, don't allow, don't allow any rock music, country, western, or contemporary Christian music. He said he would, he, this, my dad was very deaf on this, and I'm just telling you, and I think it was a good thing. There are, the Bible says, remember not the sins of my youth. Uh, the Bible tells us that Paul told Timothy, he said, he said, I want you to flee what kind of lust? Youthful lust, youthful desires. And whenever you're in the adolescent ages and your young age, most of you, and, and some of you struggle, and, and, and I'm not, I don't know who you are, but I'm sure there are some adults here that struggle with music. And you justify it, and you, you've kept those CDs, you've kept those tapes, you've kept that on your iPods or your phones, you, 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 you do those things, and, and uh, maybe it's, maybe it's an uh, old rock song or a 50s or a 60s or a 70s or 80s or a disco song, or it might be a country western song. It could be some contemporary music, but may I say most of us, we started that attraction, that desire started when we were young. And if we were 13 and 14 and 15 years old, sometimes younger, and that's where we got those things. We got those in our head, and, and now they're, they're part of our, our, our person. And sometimes those things are very difficult to break away from. And my dad was very serious about that, and I'm so grateful. And the biblical principles are there, because music, several things about music. First of all, music is for God. Making melody in your hearts to the... Lord. Make a joyful noise of the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. See, we want music that we like. God wants us to sing and participate in music that he likes. 
Sometimes people will come to church. Well, I just don't like the music there. It's just way too old-fashioned. And you know, I will just say to you, and I, I want to make sure that God is honored with the music. I would rather stay farther to the right, and I don't really care what you like. I don't care what I like. I want to, I want to evaluate this. Would that hurt the Lord? If it pushes the envelope, I'm not really interested. And, I'm just, and, and maybe you say, well, Pastor, you're, you're never going to have a big church. You're never going to have a lot of people come because you're just too strict on that area. I, I really don't care about people coming. I care about what, the, what pleases the Lord. Because music is for the Lord. That's very clear. Number two, music starts in the heart. Music starts in the heart. Making melody in your what? Hearts to the Lord. Music is very powerful. Third thing I find out about music is that music is a medium. It teaches. Most of us learn our ABCs by a song. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Stop singing it. You can stop right now. <laughs> our first song, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. You learn those songs. Scripture songs. I learned many of my scripture songs through music. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help. I think one of the most popular songs in our ministry was written, Miss, uh, was written by the Lord, but put the music of Miss Zeta there. I can't go to any youth gathering when they won't sing that, that song of, uh, of, of Psalm 139. Just a, gr a great song. And so many of those songs are good. But music teaches. I was reading today in Ezekiel where the Bible describes Satan. And he says, you know, you're, you've fallen from heaven. But he said, he said, but when you were formed, you are formed by the Lord. You are formed with pipes and music within you. And it's no surprise to me that the Satan uses, you can't even, they won't even sell you a car without rock music. Go, go, go to a mall and not hear music. It's the music going on, and, and even, even uh, at Christmas time, we're, we're very captivated by the music that we heard as children, and it just plays into our mind. And it's much easier to sing Jingle Bell Rock than it is to sing Away in the Manger. It comes very natural to, to us to, to be familiar with those things, and it's a medium that Satan uses if he got kicked out of heaven and he was the musician of heaven it's natural that he would use uh, music to infiltrate people's lives and now we have the, the 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 contemporary christian music and and they use the world's music and the world's pop to put jesus words and sweet words and they just blend the two and uh, it's just, to me, it's just, I just, I, I, I don't have time, I'm not talking about it tonight. We have talked about it before. I've spent series on that particular thing. But I tell you what, friend, uh, you know, contemporary, you know, Christian rock, even the rock and roll is very sexual in connotation. Christian rock is like Christian pornography. This doesn't go together. And the devil does, God doesn't borrow something from Satan in his realm in order to do his work especially when it's questionable. They understand, the world understands it. And, and it's appetites that have to be generated inside of our hearts. Psalm 40, verse number 3, He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto my God. God put a new song in our hearts, and, there should be, and it has to be, that has to be developed. And an appetite for right kind of music is very, very important. And filtering our mind from those things. I remember leading a man to Christ years ago, he was doing so good, he was going through discipleship. And then all of a sudden, one Friday night, I couldn't get a hold of him. And Saturday, I couldn't get a hold of him. And Sunday, and I found that he went on a, on a drug binge. And it was so disheartening because he was doing so well. And when he came to, to back to the Lord and got healthy, he said, you know, Pastor, let me tell you what happened. He said, I got, off the, I got off my work and I was hot and sweaty. And he said, I just sat in my car and... And I'd already gotten rid of my, my tapes and my CDs in my car, but I just thumbed through my family. I was sitting there, I was sitting there hot in my car, and I just started thumbing through the music stations, and I found a country western music. He said, I started listening to that country western music, and then I listened to the next song, the next song. He said, before I know it, Pastor, I was going to the bar. And to hear more, and to, it got me in a mood to, to go back in the group that I used to go in. And once I put a few beers in me, 
my resistance went down, and then I went out and looked for speed. And I found speed, and that took me on a seven-day journey away from God, regrettable. I lost my job. You know where it all started, Pastor? It started with a song. It started with music. And it put me into a, into a, in, into a mindset, resisted my, resi- my it, it weakened my resistance, and then continued down. I dealt with a number of young people. I remember one of the most scary times I've dealt a sixth grader. His name was Peter, and it was my early years of teaching school, and he was, he was going through a difficult time. And he, just, he was a good, smart boy, and then all of a sudden his grades started taking a nosedive. And his mother was concerned. I was concerned. I went over to his house, and she said, Pastor, she goes, I'm nervous. And she wasn't a Christian. Her mom wasn't a Christian. Peter, I believe, accepted the Lord, but he had, he had been listening to this music that was self-destructive. It talked of suicide. It talked of all kinds of things. And, uh, and he had that, and I started, he started reading just the titles of the songs, and it was just so awful. I said, Peter, you've got to get rid of this. No, you're not taking my music. And it was just, just a sweet boy, and boy, he got so angry and so mad. And I remember there with him, I said, Peter, really, these are hurtful to your, to your health, to your, to your spirit, to your grace, to your mom. I don't care. This is the only thing I have. And boy, he put that, that headset on his head and screamed and, get out, get out. I'm not going to give this to anybody. Boy, it was, in a, it was an addiction as a sixth grader that really had taken him down a wrong road. And uh, I'm thankful my dad saw fit to watch what I listened to. By the way, spirit-filled listeners, yeah, music will come. The Bible tells us that be not drunk with wine where is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. People who get away from God oftentimes begin to entertain wrong kind of music. I oftentimes say this, and I don't know if I'm exactly right in this, but I've, I've said this to many people, and I do believe it's certainly two, if it's not only two, there's certainly two things, that if, if people do not, if Christians do not address these two issues and fall where God falls on them, they will cripple themselves from being the vibrant Christians they ought to be. Number one is music. Number two is money. Two M&Ms. If if you're not willing to address how you spend, invest, make your money, you're going to struggle spiritually. It doesn't mean it'll take you to hell. It just means you're you're not going to be the Christian you ought to be. Number two, if if you do not address music, you cannot live a holy life on a diet of ungodly music, or even, in my opinion, the Christian contemporary music. I think it will, def- it w- it will hurt you. It will numb your spiritual senses. And uh, I think as parents, you have responsibilities. I have responsibilities. I have my children. I love them, but sometimes their taste in music, they're youthful. And the devil's very wise. He's trying to get them hooked on things that, as they're young and youthful lust and get their desires so they can have them the rest of his life, the rest of their life. He can continue to cripple them from that. So watch the music. And, and I'm grateful my dad did that as well. And many times uh, the Lord helped me, and, and my dad was, would be all over that. And he would just he would get very, very serious about that matter, I'm thankful he was. Let's continue if we can. Number three. Personally, stay in the Word of God and an attitude of prayer. As moms and dads, we must stay in the Word of God and an attitude of prayer. Let's take time to look through these scriptures real quickly. Joshua 1, verse number 8. Would you all turn there with me? Joshua 1, 8. Let's read it together. This is a, a verse on the Bible. Let's read it together if we can, please. Verse number 8 of chapter 1 of Joshua. Here we go. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have... This is the only place in the Bible the word success is mentioned, and it revolves around what I do with the Bible. Remember years ago I had a teacher at college say, what you do with the Bible determines what God does with you, and that is true making sure we make much of the scriptures and in our own lives. Parents, you cannot reproduce what you don't have. If you don't love the Bible, you can't raise children who love the Bible. You must love it first. 
It must be in your heart to take it to the young people. Let's look real quick at Deuteronomy. We're in Joshua. Go back one book, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. The book of Deuteronomy is a book of remembrance, and God wants us to remember some things. These people had not uh, crossed the Red Sea as adults, and they had been 40 years in the wilderness, and God wanted to remind them some things. I want you, if you would please, look at verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is, is one Lord. Verse number 5, and thou shalt love the Lord God with all thine heart, and uh, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words, which I have commanded thee this day, shall be where? Now verse 7, read it with me if you would please. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. When thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down. Here we hear the God reminds us that, first of all, I need to have God's word in me, and then I want to pass that on to our children. And when shall I do it? Well, when you go to bed at night, <laughs> when you wake up in the morning, when you walk by the way, basically every child all the time. Every opportunity, look for times to pass on the scriptures. And then be people of prayer. I've given the verse of scripture, Luke 18, 1, men are always to pray and not to faint. And stay faithful at that. Pray without ceasing. Look at, verse, uh, look at number four. Once again, these are in succession here, but make sure there's distinction in their dress, their haircut. Watch the music. Walk with God personally and be in an attitude of prayer continually. I always loved it when my dad told me, John, I'm praying for you. He said, I'm pr I prayed for you last night several times. I'm glad that my dad it made it real to me. He said, I couldn't sleep last night. I just kept praying for my kids. I prayed for you, prayed for Matt, prayed for Mark, Luke, Jan, and Mary. Just for them to tell me, I prayed for, he prayed for me. And I try to do it with my own children. Uh, grandmas and grandparents, tell, tell, grandpa, grandpa and grandmas, tell your kids, your grandkids you're praying for. Let them know, man, I prayed for you last night. Pray that God would strengthen you with his might in the inner man. You'll be strong in the inner man. Tell your children, I'm praying for you. I think these are very important things. And, and be in an attitude of prayer. Pray for them and then tell them, I'm praying for you. It means a lot to them. Text them that. Uh, my, I, my, oldest, my oldest boys are in college, and oftentimes I just, I, when I pray for them, after I get done, I'll just text them and say, hey, I'm praying for you today. I love you. I'm proud of you. Keep living for the Lord. And inevitably, they always text me back. Thanks, Dad. I appreciate it. And they need to know that. They need to know that the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. And somebody's praying for them. It's very important for them. Okay, number four. Never allow your child to talk back, throw a fit, or lie, and get away with it. Okay, let me just say this. Every child will talk back sometimes. Every child will throw a fit. It's part of our nature. Every child will lie. That's not the problem. And by the way, I'll just say this to you. Never be act surprised when your child does something wrong. You did wrong too. But be disappointed. I think we can be disappointed without being shocked. I can't believe it. Well, you did it, Dad, when you were young and dumb. But we ought to say, you know what? Uh, is, is rather than being surprised, we can just be, I'm, I'm extremely disappointed. Disappointed as I can be. I just, it's hard for me to just be happy on a day like this when you've done this certain thing. Just disappoint me. Just, just a gut punch. Let them know the disappointment that you feel because of their decision. But when they do something wrong, and my dad gave three categories, uh, someone who is someone who talks back, uh, someone who, is, who, who uh, throws a fit, and someone who lies. But if they do that, and they will do that, you've got to, you've got to get with it right quickly and deal with those very quickly. Don't let them do that and get about it. Oh, sometimes I've seen, I've seen parents and their little kids, they're just in eight, ten months old and they're throwing a fit and their people are chuckling. <laughs> hey, when they're eight months, that might be funny. When they're 13, that's not funny. But if you don't deal with them in eight months, they don't remember eight months old. They don't remember two and three, but they can learn, hey, that's not going to work. I'm not doing that. That's why the Bible says chasing them be times early on in their life, early on, early dawn. So that you don't have to spend their whole teenage years, adolescence. You'll have to deal with them. You have to still give correction and direction, but it will not have to be as serious if you'll do your job on the front end. That's why I would think, and I'm going to say this, and it's not, it's not a criticism, but when you have little guys, 
Mama, if you can be home with them, be home with them when they're little. Some of you think, oh, well, I'll, I'll stay home when they're a little bit older, and, and we'll, but we'll do the daycare now because they won't know anything. Oh, no, they learn more between birth and four years old than they learn any four years of their life, college included. They can learn authority. They can learn what's right. They can learn respect. All those things can be done, and we often we farm them out and put them in front of a television someplace and put them in front of a video, and they know more about Barney, and they know about this, and Caillou, and everybody else, and they haven't spent time with mom and dad. And I think these are some things to be careful on, and, I, and I, once again, I think this is just my opinion, but I do believe that if we can help our moms and our dads give attention to their children when they're young, it's much easier and, and to deal with lying, to deal with disrespect, to deal with losing their temper. All that comes natural. Look at a couple of verses real quickly. First of all, I want you to look at uh, Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Is disrespect serious to God? Look at Proverbs chapter 30. Look at verse number 17 among other principles in this chapter and in this, in this book. By the way, Proverbs is a good place for many parents to live in during child-rearing times. Children need this. Verse number 17, let's read it together. The eye that mocketh his father. Man, that's pretty serious. And what your kids say a lot, and we say a lot with our eyes. You know, this, whatever. Okay? despising to obey your mom, mocking your dad with your, with your you, know, you know how dad is, uh-huh. Especially mocking and, and dis- disrespecting. He said that kind, of, that kind of guy loses his vision. I don't think the eagles come out and pluck his eyeball out, but he loses spiritual vision because of rebellion and because of disrespect. And it's pretty serious, but they need to help help them under, under do that, uh, learn that through. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter eight and verse number eleven. The power of intervening and confronting. Most of us struggle with that. I I don't know. Maybe not everybody struggles with that. I kind of struggle with that. I don't like conflict. I don't like confrontation. But it's so needful as a parent. So needful. Look, if you would please, at verse number 11 of Ecclesiastes, chapter 8, verse 11. Read it out loud with me. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Okay, he says, because a, an offense is not dealt with quickly, it hardens the heart of the person to do evil continually. It's one of the things that's wrong with our penal system today. A guy can kill someone today and he won't have to go to court for the next year. And then he gets sentenced later on after that. And, if, and, and there's so much time that laps by that when something's done quickly, then all of a sudden everybody gets to figure, hang on a second, this is not worth it. They deal with that. I'm not, not in, but you go to some countries of the world and stealing is not a problem. Now you see a few guys walk around with their hand cut off, but the, the stealing's not a problem. I'm not a proponent of that, but, uh, but because whenever someone's caught doing something wrong, they deal with it very fast, then all of a sudden everybody else figures out, I don't think I'm going there. And that happens in the life of a child, too. And some, when they do something wrong, it doesn't mean you need to be, don't, don't lose your temper, but be willing to deal with it quickly. And I have done that many times as a dad, not as many times I probably should, but whenever, whenever a child does something wrong, to quickly Help them with that. Deal with it in, in respect. Deal with it in control. But say, no, sir, we're not doing that. And we're going to fix that right now. And I've had my kids say, Dad, can we just do it tomorrow? Can we just go do it tomorrow? In restitution, when they do something wrong. And then I stop the world and we say, okay, we're going to do this right now. But Dad, don't you have things to do? I've got things to do. But this is more important. Because you are involved. Dad, nobody's dad does this. I'm not always dad. I'm your dad. Dad, you're just, you're like, you're hitting a net with a hammer, Dad. Okay. Next time you want to think about doing that, we're not doing that again. Let's go. And we have sometimes gone through some extreme measures to, to rectify things that are wrong or try to apologize when we've done something wrong or hurt someone's feelings or things. It's not fun. It's not fun for me. It's not fun for my child. Uh, at the same time, I think they'll think twice before they open their big mouth again. 
They'll think twice before they do that wrong thing. I remember my mom and dad, my dad one time was in a grocery store. And, uh, and uh, we were walking through, my dad did all the shopping. He, he, he didn't want my mom to do it, so he would go do it and just tell her whatever he, whatever he brought home was what she had to cook. It was just the way he was. And, but uh, we, at the end, of the end of the checkout, we couldn't find two of our kids and two of my brothers and sisters, and they, they had gotten a hold of the, the produce aisle. They started eating these things. They thought they were good. They were actually hot peppers, you know. And, oh, man, those kids are wiping their eyes. They're screaming their head off. And he just thought that was the funniest thing. More than one time, one of, her, one of my siblings had stolen something from the, from the store. You know, he told them to get that. And I don't want to get it. Then all of a sudden, he'd take it, and he'd find it later on the car. We'd drive back to the store. He would make them pay for it. He'd make them go back and give it to the manager, call the manager, too. And he'd say, listen, my son stole something here. And he's going to come tell you, and I don't want you to give him any, any. I want you to be as strong and as serious as you possibly can be, because I want to learn a lesson here. And he's done that several times with my, with my siblings years ago, because he wanted, he wanted to deal with something quickly and help them and make them a big deal, uh, whether it be working, working, or whatever the thing is, whatever is big enough and needs to be dealt with. Last thing, real quickly, just give you the thought here, is that give them chores and responsibilities insist that they do a good thorough job give them chores and responsibilities and working on these things i'll, I'll give that see a man diligent in his business he'll stand before kings learning how to do things be diligent in knowing the state of your, your flocks look well to your herds uh train up a child the way he should go um un confidence an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint how many have ever chipped your tooth before you chipped your tooth miserable Chip your tooth. Both of my front teeth are false because playing ice hockey one day and got a guy mad. He put a stick in my mouth. Another time I was riding a bike and knocked my teeth out. But men, both times uh, after that, with both days, one, the, the day, especially on the ice hockey, I was at the little red, red barn ice rink in Superior, Wisconsin, and uh, it happened during the outside. And boy, after I got my, my tooth chipped, I kept my mouth shut all the way home. Every time any cool air went in there, man, my, my head felt like it was going to blow off. Hurt so bad. And I, and I thought about that verse, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of difficulties or troubles. It's like a broken tooth. It's something just, it, it hurts you so bad. Or a foot that's out of joint. Your ankle gets sprained. Your whole body, ah, you just, you're, you're staying on that. And it cripples the whole body. He said, that's how it is when someone is not faithful to finish a job. And that takes time, but these are things we ought to do for our children. And a few just Proverbs from my father. Let's pray together.